Revelation uh, 14, verses 6 to 12. That's our mission. Preach Amen. the three angels' message. I Amen. Mean, Praise the Lord. So, that, so he, he said the key word, which is my next question. But I'm going to get the rest of, of the panelists to answer that according to what the Lord has impressed you. Okay. So, Brother Raj, uh, that same question, 60 seconds. <laughs> Uh, so in addition to what Elder Ray mentioned, I want to add that it is also the mission of the Adventist movement to bring out the true character of Jesus Christ. In addition to the three angels' messages, there's another angel, Revelation 18. Sure, we, we, you could, we don't have time to read it, but um, we, you know, we just sang the song, Jesus is coming again. If we truly believe that, if we believe we're living in that time, then very soon is the loud cry. So we really, really need to be preparing people to hear that loud cry and respond appropriately. Yeah, you know, uh... In, in, in light of, you know, taking uh, the Great Commission of Matthew, uh, you know, 28, um, it's in the light of the, third, the three angels' messages. And the three angels' messages is something that Martin Luther couldn't preach. It, it's something that, you know, the earlier Christian church couldn't do. That's been entrusted to us. And that those three unique messages are calling the world to reform. Reform of heart, soul, and 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 body. I mean, in, in essence of like our we, you know, that's where the health message comes in. You know, everything. So we're 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 lifting up everything that was forgotten and downtrodden. And so we have been given a greater. Ta the, I think the greatest work that's going to be done is going to be that end time message, uh, just like the early church. So again, uh, it, it's it's spreading the gospel in the light of those beautiful messages. Of Revelation 14. Amen. Praise the Lord. That was uh, wonderful. And uh, that's segueing into my next uh, question now. Um, praise the Lord. We are supposed to be having the light of the reform of the three angels' message. Amen. Amen. Now, Revelation 14, 6, uh, the foundation of the three angels' message and how it starts. Okay, uh, now this is to the panel again. What, in your personal opinion, or based on what um, the Lord is impressing, what is the foundation? Are the key message in the three angels message what is the core and the first message that we should share to the world to the world to the world what is the first what is the first message or the way that we attract the world i'm not talking about seven day Adventists. yeah i understand i'm not talking about christians i'm talking about to the world what is the core message of the three angels message and the the first part of it that is supposed to attract the world you know, listen, I learned something from Joe Cruz long ago about evangelism. And one thing you got to do is you have to meet people where they are. So in other words, you may have uh, a particular work that you're doing, but the situation may, may mean you have to adapt. You got to modify to the situation. You can't always have a fixed uh, mindset that this is the way it's going to be beforehand. Because, uh, you know, if someone's got a severe medical illness, uh, they don't need to hear about the state of the dead right now. You know, they need that medical work taken care of. So where do you begin? I think when you look at the three angels message in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, and as, as our sister brought out, you know, accompanied with the, third, uh, the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Look, these are, these are not only distinct messages given in regard to the nature of what must be proclaimed, but you got to also understand that these are also principles guiding you through your life in relation to how you you reach other people, you know, the, and, and uh, so I think you need to understand that, for example, <clears throat> I remember one time when Heartland College and we were sitting there and a similar, similar question came up actually, you know, what do you do in evangelism when you're doing, uh, you're, uh, you know, reaching people, you know, what's the first subject? Well, usually there is a structural order, but again, you got to also, as I say, uh, read, read your audience. For example, one time I was in Africa over in, uh, I think, Tanzania, and they sent me to a city called Maragoro. Now, it had about a million people there. <clears throat> I didn't know at the time. No one told me. They informed me prior. But I remember looking at my translator. We were out in this, uh, it was the only soccer stadium in the whole region. 
And uh, so that's where we had to preach. And we're, I'm with my translator. He, speak, he speaks Swahili. I didn't. And so he, I saw all these people with white robes and white hats. I mean, literally just hundreds and hundreds of them. So I thought, man, I looked over to my translator. And said, well, I said, man, who's all these people? And he said, well, they're the Muslims. I said, you're telling me they're every one of those guys out there wearing that white robes are Muslims? He said, yeah. I said, well, I wish you all would have told me. I said, because I'm going to tell you something. I would have modified my sermons, Revelation 8 and 9, talking about the rise of Islam. I would have talked to the whole series on the life of, and, and, and of Abraham, talking about Abraham is your father, Abraham is my father, but Abraham was a Sabbath keeper. He ain't a Friday keeper. Yeah. You know, you got to adapt. You've got to touch people where they are and understand not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, psychologically, in this case, religiously. So I'd say, where do you start? You know, there is a rhyme and reason and order for a second, third angel. It wouldn't, if there wasn't, God wouldn't have put it that way. Amen. So there is an order, but in that order, there's no doubt you have got to tap into where people are. Look at the life of Jesus. Look at that. And you see, he always touched people the most where they needed it. Then the door was open. Boom. Salvation came. Praise the Lord. Brother Raj. <laughs> sure. So. <clears throat> For me, in the last uh, last several months, uh, God has put in my heart to talk about fear not, fear God. Because your question was, uh, how do we address the world? Not the Adventists, but outside the Adventist circle, right? So then when I prayed about this, you know, these, these words, and God, God gave this name, the battle for your frontal lobe. And then God gave the idea as to, to reach outside of the Adventist circle with this, with these words, fear not, fear God. So that being said, today the world is, you know, controlled by fear yes, or by force, which is actually uh, what I'm paraphrasing from Spirit of Prophecy, where Sister White said that Satan will control by fear or through force. And we see that happening around the world and people are looking for hope people are looking for answers people are looking for truth and people are fed up watching so called news mm -hmm. and uh, therefore we are now in a time where we have to be out to proclaim the three angels messages but at the same time give people hope and not add more fear into their lives but give them hope uh, reach them with compassion and love and be non-judgmental. Amen. So praise the Lord, brethren. So uh, I, I want everybody to focus on this now. There were some key words that I'm going to ask the audience now, OK? What was one of the key word that uh, um, hit or, or stuck in your mind and what Pastor DiCarlo said and what uh, Brother Rod said? Anybody? You can say it out loud. Oh, one second. Now lift your hands up, and I'll, I'll get you. So Yes, one of the key words, I think, was meet people where they are and also give them hope. Amen. Amen. And somebody else here? Sis. Yeah, uh, I like what... Fear uh, God and give glory. Oh. Amen. Fear God and give glory. Now, we in the Bible, uh, we use the word fear, um, but it also denotes... Um, you you want to say something? Adapt. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So, so brothers and sisters... Um, one of those key words, uh, again, is the three angels message a message of condemnation in, or is it a message of love? Message of love. Okay, absolutely. It's the what? Everlasting gospel. So sister um, Heidi and brother, uh, uh, brother Benny, I'm gonna ask you now, uh, if the three angels message is a message of love, how should we as Seventh-day Adventists present it to the non-believer or to quote unquote the world? Now. Uh, for the sake of our audience and those that are watching online and on YouTube world, um, and those that are also Christians, in the Bible, there are key words such as pagan, unbeliever, non-believer, or infidel, or something like that, okay? Those are not bad words. We within Christianity apply a negative connotation to those things. It only means unbeliever, okay? Meaning, these individuals or those that we use when we use pagan or cult, they're in a different uh, sphere of, it, of, uh, of their life, okay? We need to understand that we need to be loving and we need to be uh, embracing, okay? Not pushing. 
So Sister Heidi, uh, if you can uh, address that, how is the Three Angels message a message of love and how should we encapsulate it when we're giving it to the world? God is love and in, in, in our Bible work, in our meeting with people, in our relationships with others, um, we really have to exemplify the character of God because in most religions, it's largely maligned. And if we are to fear God and give glory to him, how can we do that if we don't properly understand his character? Amen. And we are to exemplify that. And so uh, specifically in Bible work, uh, every, every doctrine, every Bible study, every topic, we discuss the character of God and what is God's character truly like? Because we shouldn't be afraid of him, but we are to respect him and love him. And when someone, understands that maybe they had a misconception about God, who he really is, what his character is really like. And then when they see through the Bible, through the gospel, what his character is really like, then they, they have a whole new desire for living. Amen. Amen. Uh, Brother Ben. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I remember a statement that says that Christ's method can never be improved up on. And, and because it's perfect, right? And so as we talked about this morning, um, Ministry of Healing, page 127, Christ's method alone will bring true success, right? You can have success, but there's that true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingle with men as one who desired their good, not for my benefit, right? Yeah. One who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them, step two, right? He ministered to their needs, then he bade them follow me, right? So bidding them follow me, think of it as this the second angel's message. Leave Babylon and come follow what I have, what I'm a part of, right? But before that, there's those steps of like, hey, you know, I'm coming down and I'm ministering to you. I want you to know that I care about you. Once I realize that you care about me, all those guards are down now, you know? influence that they have you know the influence that you have over them grows and so they begin to listen to you begin to implement what you're telling them what you're teaching them so on and so forth but that has to also be a success in your life right if you're preaching the health message to them truly and really in your heart in your soul the health message had to have worked for you for you to be a testimony right i mean you really believe it, it through and through you know you know what it did for you and that's how a lot of people can, I mean, people could even just look at you and be like, I could tell he's earnest because of the, 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 the passion and love that you have for your Lord. And they're like, man, who is this Lord? Right. So and, and as uh, Elder DiCarlo said, uh, you know, adapting to the situation that you're dealing with, to who you're talking to and so on and so forth. And then bringing that with that. I love you and I'm doing it for you, not for my benefit uh disinterested benevolence right and so that's how we are we 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 are to reach them and i can say let me just say this and lastly calling when i first came into the church man anyone who knew me uh, uh, the millers knew me uh sister coretta knew me let me tell you i was a brawler i'll put you in your place i knew spirit of prophecy left and right but one thing i knew i wasn't winning people i knew i had a lot of knowledge zeal through the roof but I, I sat down one day and I prayed to God and I'm like, I am not having success. Why is that? And then ran across that Christ method. And I, I changed, I totally changed because I'm expecting ideals. And so, when somebody didn't do the ideal, it used to upset me, and annoy me. I'm like, I want you to come up now and, and so on. And I had to realize that, man, you could, people, you could put people in spiritual shock and trying to get, elevate them overnight to, to a certain level that they can't handle. So it's like getting to their level and slowly and prayerfully, lovingly, patiently, and so on, and bringing them up to the height that God wants them, right? So just remember that. I mean, we all want the ideal, and ideal is important, right? We want to fulfill the will of the Lord, but God knows it takes time. That's why he gives us mercy and time for reform, right? Um, and so what I'm saying is that, one, don't be discouraged, uh, and, and, and two, don't be harsh, 
All right, don't be harsh in trying to reach the people. Give them room to grow, but encourage them to continually come up. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So uh, that's uh, again leading. I think the Holy Spirit is working. We are called what Christians. Amen. And Christians are are what or who? Followers of who? Christ. Now, will the world, each of us, now just look into your own self, will someone in your sphere of influence consider you to be a Christian? Okay, so these are the questions that we must ask ourselves. Are we, are we being Christians and do other people see Christ in us? And how did Christ actually physically on this earth minister and win souls? So that's our, our next question into uh, taking it from theory now to practical, okay? And we're going to do that for another few minutes. And then after that, I'm going to open up some questions uh, to the audience, okay? So practically now, uh, I want some practical examples in 2023, which is present truth, amen? So in 2023, what are some practical ways that we as Christians or Seventh-day Adventists, without being condemnatory, judgmental, fault-finding, and pushy, how can we be drawing people to Christ? Not to us, but to who? Christ. So with that being said, um, who wants to go first? Okay, Brother Raj. Sure. So um, again, adapting, right? That's the key word uh, the last uh, few minutes. In my personal experience, when I approach a, a Hindu, I ask, can I pray for you? Now, that's something very uh, strange for a Hindu to hear, because in Hinduism, there's nothing called like personal prayers. Uh, there's, there are rituals. There are rituals, a lot of rituals that people do, but personally, someone praying for them that's new concept and in your prayer when you ask God sincerely to bless that individual even though the person is Hindu that person will realize that you care about that person and you want the best for the person so that has been my approach consistently with Hindus and it has always been by God's grace a success amen praise the Lord so now brothers and sisters how many of us have got jobs? How many are working in the, in, in, in the world right now? Okay, anybody is working? Okay. Do you, each of us, get in contact with Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, uh, Catholic, Baptist? Correct, amen? So our strategy and our tactics should be unique for each individual person, correct? So we need to understand others and their culture as well. And we also need to understand what they believe. Two reasons. One, we don't want to offend them. Two, we want to see how we can draw them. Amen? So, so this afternoon, uh, Brother Raj is going to share a little bit about Hinduism and about yoga and, and how it uh, connects. The reason why we're doing that is because we are trying to do a series uh, moving forward, especially here. A lot of our brethren in this area uh, are into New Age, okay? or the Rastafarian movement, or they're into a lot of, um, okay, which yoga and a lot of Hindu concepts are in there as well, okay? We as Christians and Seventh-day Adventists, we need, what do we tend, normally tend to do when we look at other people like that? Thank you. Uh, say that loudly, brother, here. I'll, you get the mic for that one. We judge, but not in the sense of like, you know, judge righteously, but we kind of condemn. That's right. So look, nowadays we within Adventism, and you know, the North American division has been flat for years, as Pastor Aaron Baker said, for years in regards to evangelism, correct? Uh, most of us, uh, and we're going to talk about that also, if you if you see here, what is something that you see in this panel right now, from the audience? What do you see in this panel? Huh? Yes, you see Revelation 14, chapter six, correct? All right. Do you see that? Yeah. So you see, the, you see what uh, Josiah Missions and what we're trying to do here at Libraries, right? You know that every church wants to have their own people group to be leaders, to be in charge, and to make sure they only stick with their racial community, community and also, okay, it, within Seventh-day Adventism as well. 
okay? And these are the issues that are stopping us from experiencing righteousness by faith, 1888, correct? So righteousness by faith, brethren. So, so now as we segue into, into our next uh, few minutes, I want us to focus on, and I think Pastor DeCarlo has uh, the book of Acts, um, what was the experience of the early church and disciples and what were they doing when they were coming together, okay, before they actually went into the world? Pastor DeCarlo. I'm I, I just want to pick up on something Go right uh, that you mentioned. You know, uh, you talked about the various racial groups, and uh, and it's it's a beautiful thing to do everything you can to help anybody and everybody, regardless of what you know racial ethnic background they may have. However, though, in certain circumstances, only someone from that one racial group is going to be able to reach certain people in that racial group because of various biases and prejudices and so forth. For example, if you go and I, you know. It, you know, if, if a group of people, regardless of their ethnic background, it has racial biases towards another group, the last thing you want to do is send a missionary from that group into that other group. Because they're going to think, Sonny boy, what are, you know, what are you doing here? And Sister White talks about this in, 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 in uh, the book of Evangelism and other Southern stuff. work. Yeah, so we're coming to that. Work. So he's, look, the Lord is working, okay? I, I was trying to set it up, but the, the Lord's bringing it. Well, but I'm ahead, just saying, you know, that there's, again, it comes back to be practical, be flexible, adapt and be rational. Don't be bullheaded and think, you know, uh, you know, look, I've been to places like I went to, like I say, I was talking about Tanzania over there. And it, it, even though it was a strong Muslim, the Muslims loved me because I'm telling them not to eat pork, stay away from alcohol. And I'm praising because once I figured out, you know, they were Muslims, there was a strong Muslim city. Uh, I adapted real quick my sermons, even though I couldn't change them at the time I had to adapt, you know, and you, and it, you learn, you learn, you know what I'm talking about. You have to adapt, but you're not going to survive. So so uh, I started to, to uh, push certain issues. And, and the Muslims, I say, they loved me. Um, but it was the Catholics who hated me. And uh, and so, you, you know, it's funny because it's it's something that even though you may not expect, you still have to realize, you know, in certain cases, certain like Paul says this and, and you brought you kind of refresh my memory on that one. You know, he says to a Jew, I'm a Jew to a Greek, I'm a Greek. And he's talking about, you know, who you're dealing with. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, if you're dealing with a, a, an ethnic group. You, you start to talk their slang or the, you know, their way, because immediately they're going to think, you're a phony. You're a fake, right? I even when I did prison ministry, and I'm going to tell you something. Now, a lot of these guys, you know, all of them, they're, I never committed a crime. I'm innocent. Yeah, every one of you. You know, I mean, it comes to a point where one of you has committed the crime. So, but they, they teach you real quick and they can see right through you because they are habitual liars. They're habitual con artists. Okay. So they know a con when they're being conned. You understand? They know they're when they're being played. And so one day I, 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 a friend of mine, we went into the prison and, uh, he got the guard. And he said, unlock the door, and, and, and he went into the cell. I said, what are you doing? Because I'm not thinking to myself, I ain't going to no, I, mean, I don't mind witnessing, but man, I ain't going into the cell with the, with the inmates because they got to lock all the doors behind them when the guards leave, which means if there's any incident, that's it. So I said, he said, no, 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 we're going to go and witness. I'm thinking, okay. So I, so I walked in with him. <laughs> and I, I'm honest. I'm, I'm, be, I'm nervous. But I went in. So it got to the point, you, 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 it, just, it just wasn't, I didn't think much of it after that, because you, when you're involved and everybody knows this, when you're in a Bible study, the spirit takes over. Yeah. Right? You all know that. The God takes over. And something happens. Words are coming out of your mouth. Your mind is thinking thoughts that you never thought of or had. Words are being spoken. You're thinking, man. Phew. So things are happening. So one day I went in, I was by myself one time and I got the guard, I went in and I would sit with the inmates inside, my, my friend and I, he and I would do this. So we would go from cell to cell. 
And one day we saw this Baptist book fella coming on in. I didn't know who he was. I'd never seen him before. And uh, he would stand outside. And by the way, just to show you, we, we, we can come in with a suit and a tie. We, we, it's not that we would dress like hobos, but we would dress casual. We, we were neat, clean, respectful, you know, in terms of our decorum, but we weren't stiff and cold. You, you follow what I'm saying? Because sometimes it can be intimidating. They already know why you're there. You bring in the Holy Bible. You've been talking to them. You don't have to be so, you know, stiff about it. Remember, adapt yourself, be adaptable. But again, you don't, you know, people often say that I had heard this. Jesus, you talked about how the Lord ministered. Well, look, he sat with the publicans and sinners. That doesn't mean he participated in the things that they were doing that he knew to be wrong because he never did. However, though, he wasn't so cold and distant that he wouldn't get close to them. He would get close to them. He got friendly with them. That's why they loved him. And why didn't they love the Pharisees? Because we all remember the parable. You remember the story of the two men who were praying? One man was a sinner. He knew he was a sinner. He wouldn't even dare lift up his head. And yet you had the self-righteous Pharisee dressed in the most elegant uh, attire that you could, you know, money could buy. And what did he say? Thank God, Lord, I'm not like this guy. And that, but you know, so it, it taught me a lot because with inmates, what happened was the inmates, when they made, I made comment about this fellow, I said, oh, who's he? I didn't know who the fellow was who came in and later found out he was a Baptist preacher. And they said, uh, oh, he's a Baptist preacher. I said, uh, I, I said oh, oh, okay. I said, why didn't he come in? I, I wasn't trying to stir up. It was just, I was just asking, just inquiring, just trying to know what was going on. And they said, oh, no, no, he won't come in. That's why nobody wants to talk to him. And I thought, boy, I'm glad I took Jimmy's advice. That was my friend. And went in because, you see, he knew, Jimmy knew, by the way, just a little footnote on Jimmy. Jimmy was an ex-con who went to that same prison. So Jimmy knew all the ins and outs. So he understood he understood the nature of a, of, a, of, a, of a con artist. You know, if you're going to reach people, you've got to go to their level. And, uh, and you look at the life of Jesus, you look at Acts, you know, you talk about Acts. Acts is all about getting your heart light, uh, 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 and life right. Because remember, when you have the resurrection of Jesus, a sequence of events now kicks in. You got Jesus 40 days spending with the disciple reinstructing them regarding the things that he taught them while he was alive and verifying things that they had questions over then you have the 10 days right jesus ascends to heaven he told him now this is where he picks up this this is where the story he says um um he says hang on yeah, he says, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Of course, this is the, the Pentecost 10 days. He says, and you shall be my wit be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and uh, Samaria and on the uttermost parts of the earth. And look at the progression. He told them to start where they live, right there in the city of Jerusalem. I don't want you to go to the world first. He said, you work where you are then move on to the next level then move on to the next level in other words it's it's a it's a work that grows and but the first thing they ever did the first thing the disciples did was they made things right between each other because remember prior to that what were they arguing over what was the big argument the disciples had amongst themselves even up to the point when jesus was washing their feet who's the greatest that's what they were arguing over no no brother no, i know i love you but you you ain't me Please, you ain't as good as me. I'm a better preacher than you. That's Peter, Paul, and Jeff. They're all arguing. They're all arguing. I'm better. I'm the best. So Jesus had to deal with that. And then, the, and then those 10 days, they had to make things right with one another. I'm sorry. I apologize. I hurt you. Please forgive me. You know, whatever it might have been. Reconciliation. We don't talk about that a lot. Mm -mm. You got to make things right with one another. Make peace with God and your fellow man. Amen. You know, listen, I'm... I'm going to show you something. Now, this is where I disagree with the King James Bible. Now, don't hit me. <laughs> don't attack me. But I'm going to show you something in the King James Bible. Trust me, when I get done, you're not going to agree with it either. You're all ready? Now, I turn with me in your Bibles to the book of James. I'm going to show you something. 
<clears throat> Make sure I get the right one. I don't, I don't want to miss out now. Um, I said, what am I doing? I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong side. Here we go. Here we are. James chapter 5. By the way, this verse I'm about to read to you from the book of James, very interesting. This was a very controversial verse, particularly in the, the time of William, uh, William Tyndale. Uh, he and Thomas More, Sir Thomas More, they argued over this verse. And there was a great debate in the Protestant church and the church in general over this verse, how it should be translated. And the King James, you have to understand, what is the King James Bible? The King James Bible is not a new translation. Listen very carefully. It's a revision of a previous translation known as the Bishop's Bible. And when you understand the Bishop's Bible, which was written in 1568, when you understand the history of the Bishop's Bible, it was created by Queen Elizabeth for a purpose. To validate the Anglican Church as the Church of England and that it would be the church, the official church of the land. So the Bishop's Bible was designed for a specific purpose, okay? It wasn't about finding a new translation. Prior to 1568, prior to that, you had various Bibles that were translated from 1535. You have William Tyndale's New Testament, actually 1525, then 1534, 1535. And then, uh, then from that, you have Thomas uh, 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 Matthew's Bible. You've got uh, uh, John Rogers and so forth. You have these various, and these were the Protestant Bibles. Okay, they were Protestant, mainly made up by Protestant preachers who, who was like uh, John Rogers and, and William Tyndale. But the official Church of England didn't like that. They wanted their translation. So the bishops of England who opposed the previous translations said, we need a new translation. Queen Elizabeth said, okay, get one. And they called it the Bishop's Bible. And what it did was reinforced the Anglican theology that they got from the Catholic Church into the Anglican Church, endorsed by the bishops, which was opposed by William Tyndale, John Rogers, and the Protestants of Geneva, which produced the Geneva Bible. Y'all with me? Now, this verse I'm about to read to you is one of the prime things that I'm going to show you. This was a text that was argued, debated, and they fought over it. William Tyndale believed it should be translated differently than the King James. I agree with William Tyndale wholeheartedly. This is, comes from the Bishop's Bible, not from the Protestant Bible. And I'm going to show you. James chapter 5, look at verse 16. Look what he says in verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. All right? Confess your faults one to another. Now, that word faults right there, I'm going to look at the word confess in a second. But that word faults in the Greek means mistakes. It, be, it has multiple uh, meanings, all right? It means mistakes, it means errors, it means sins as well, includes sins. False mistakes, sins, something that may have been accidental or whatever, all right? So that the intent doesn't necessarily matter. It just means clear, you get things cleared up, okay? Regardless of what the nature may be. The question of the argument wasn't over the issue of the word fault, the issue was over the word confess. See, confess your faults one to another is an Anglican doctrine they, they got from the Catholic Church, which means when the word faults there includes the word sins, it reinforces the confessional, which reinforces the concept you need a priest to have your sins forgiven. Where William Tyndale and the Geneva Bible and many other the great staunch Protestants said, no, 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 no. We have no problem with the word fault. It does include sin. By the way, look up the Greek word. It does. I said, where we have a problem is the word confess. It doesn't say confess. In the Greek, it means acknowledge. Now look at the difference. The confessional is going out the window. I don't confess my sins to you. I don't confess my sins to you. But I do acknowledge my faults towards you if I've offended you. I'm sorry. I apologize for hurting you. I didn't mean that, brother. Please forgive me. You know that. Now, what am I doing? I'm clearing the air. When you go to the book of Acts, you got to understand something, dear friends. They cleared the air. For 10 days, they all made things right with one another. And if they had any, you found out something was wrong. I'm short up. I, I need a coat. Can you help me, brother? Or a pair of shoes or what? They, they said, okay. 
So everybody pitched in. It's called brotherly love. John chapter 17, Sister White says that is a prophecy as much as it is a sermon that Jesus gave. In other words, it's going to come to pass at some point, whether it's you, whether it's me, somebody's going to fulfill that chapter when they actually have love for one another. Amen. And right now we don't have that. I'm sorry. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we don't. And I'll tell you why we don't. Because Jesus said in John 17, when you manifest this love, the world may know that God has sent me into this world. In other words, that's when the gospel goes. You know, don't put the cart before the horse. Get your life right with God Almighty. First and foremost. Second thing is, if you got something against your brother, your sister, you better clear the air and get it right. Second thing after that is then you better make things right with God Almighty. When you've done everything in your power to do everything you can to make things right, then God's going to work with you in a way you can't imagine, in whatever capacity that might be. Get your life right with God, and God will then fill you with overflowing of the power of the unction of the Holy Spirit. And look what they did. In their own lifetime, in their own lifetime, 12 people went to the whole world and preached the gospel. The whole world was warm. Sister White, I was just reading it. I didn't even know you were going to talk about this. But Sister White, Acts the Apostles, read it. Got a whole chapter on this. And she's talking about the evangelism of the early church. And she says, they went to the entire inhabited world. Now think about that. That means everybody at this point in time, everybody heard about Jesus Christ and the gospel. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, getting to the point in, in this uh, conversation, brethren, we must have unity and love amongst ourselves. Amen. Now, as Light Bearers, Mission Seventh-day Adventist Church, since we are here, we're hosting this uh, afternoon session, we need to retrospect. And those of you that are uh, well-wishers or those that come and support us, or we need to all come together and have that unity. Amen because we have a community here in the camp springs temple hills area that we must do the work and finish the work that the lord has called us to do here amen however the harvest is plenty but the what laborers are very few and most of our laborers and i'm segueing into our next thing are old and out of shape and in and unable to do the actual manual labor that is required to go out in the mission field so we are neglecting our young people because we are focusing a lot of our church life to feed the flock of God that is of a more mature age, but we are not training the next generation. If you look at the, the early church or even Adventism, uh, most of our, our pioneers were very young when they came into and started the Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. So they use their youth, okay? They use their youth. They use that to glorify God and do the work. Till the time that some of them were so burned out that they died just because they were working so hard. So this is now what I want to do. Now we are living in 2023, amen? So practically, how can we utilize, and I'm gonna give this to the panel. I want ideas and personal experiences in regards to using Christ's method physically while we're in mingling with each other, whether in work, whether at church, whether on the subway, whether on the bus, wherever we are, that's physical mingling, okay? Now there's another, another concept in 2023, which is a different mingling, and that is called virtual mingling, amen? And where, where's, where's the majority of that happening on social web? So Christ mingling means social, right? Is, is everybody okay with the word? When we're mingling, are we socialing or socializing? Is that okay? Now, do we have a concept of social media? Okay. So we, in these last days, and you know, the young people, that's what they're doing. They're mingling on social media, but they're not mingling with the purpose. And all of us also, okay? We need to be mingling with the purpose, which is to share Christ. So now to the panel, I want to ask the panel, what are some new or 
some ways in which we, especially for the young people now, okay? We want to, we have some young people here, by God's grace, and we need to remember that every time we have a discourse or we have some kind of meetings, we must start, and, and it's unfortunate we're saying the word start, it should have already been happening. We must be raising up our young soldiers in these last days, amen? amen. So to the panel, please give us some examples, practical examples on how we can do ministry in 2023 and really reach souls. Applying Christ's method in the marketplace, on social media, and physically as well. Because when Christ went to Mary Magdalene, was he at a distance? No, no right? He was, physical, he was physically in her presence. What about the Samaritan woman? Was he at a distance? Even though it was taboo for a man, especially in the hour of that day, to be mingling with a woman. And woman of Samaria, and woman with that kind of reputation, correct? Right? We have demoniacs. We have people that were paralyzed. We had people that were blind. We, had, we see all, all, most of that stuff around us all the time, right? Okay? We, we are constantly, through media, bombarded with that. And also, when we're, especially those of us that are working in D.C. or we're in different countries in the world, uh, especially the countries that are closer to the beach or the cities that are closer to the beach, we're constantly bombarded with that type of environment. Okay? So practically, brethren, I want, I want us to focus on how can we, in 2023, and after this question and the answer, we're going to open it up to the, uh, to the audience, okay? So uh, let's start with, uh, okay, Sister, Sister Heidi, go ahead, please. So while we all have talents and gifts, it's very important for us to understand what those talents and gifts are. Uh, if you're not sure, then we can ask God to reveal our talents and gifts to us no matter what your age but especially if you're a young person ask god lord show me what my talents are and how i can use them for example um this gentleman said he was a contractor right so if you're a contractor if you uh can do handyman type of work or or fixing things right you might let in your personal ministry with your peers, your coworkers, and so forth, you might say, hey, you know, if you ever need help with something like this, let me know. They might not take you up at that moment, but when they seriously are in a bind and they've maybe messed up a project or need some help, they're going to remember you and they're gonna call you. And when they invite you to their home, that's an opportunity for you to witness right and then on a larger scale we can then think about our churches you guys are part of light bearers mission what can you offer to light bearers mission you could perhaps if you were a handyman or a contractor right you could say i'm willing to give do-it-yourself class one sunday a month there are people in the community, especially when financial times are tight, they're looking to do things themselves. They're looking to where they can save. And if they can take a class on, I don't know, plumbing or whatever it might be, then there's multiple things that are accomplished. First of all, members of the community are entering into a Seventh-day Adventist church. They're meeting someone who can give them advice and who can help them, a level of trust is being built and they will then have a resource. I mentioned earlier about the loud cry. We all should believe or probably, and, sh and I believe do believe that that loud cry is gonna go forth. What's gonna happen at that time? the holy spirit is going to be impressing people's hearts about the sabbath and about other true doctrines in god's word and when the holy spirit impresses someone's heart about the sabbath and we have a testimony we could share one of our bible students uh his sister was praying for him for years 12 years i think uh he was a sunday christian she was a sabbath keeper and they always argued they couldn't really talk about it so she just decided to pray for him lord show him the sabbath one day he was out in his yard and god spoke to him and said joe the sabbath is the seventh day the sabbath day is saturday 
And he felt and believed and immediately perceived that it was God's voice speaking to him. So what is his responsibility now to find a Sabbath keeping church? Imagine if he'd already been to one or a plumbing class or a cooking class or something else. How easy is it for him to come in when the spirit from the, when the Holy Spirit's conviction comes? So we can do things practically in our lives with our with people in our sphere of influence, and then we can lend those talents to the church to reach a wider audience. Um, so I, I, again, I told you about the medical missionary field school that we have done. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, the, and the thing was, you know, we didn't have the money to start a sanitarium or anything like that. We were where we were. So what we did was, you know, we're going to go to the people. So we started going to the churches at first and, and, and doing, um, uh, doing these classes. Actually, the first one we did was in someone's basement and brother bliss was on that class. Uh, and then, you know, we just kind of, uh, started, you know, we got invited to a church and we did it there. But uh, anyone know Everlasting Life Restaurant? Yes. yes. So, uh, so Dr. Baru called me one day, I think it was around 2013. And he was like, hey, I know you're a medical missionary. I know what that is. Can you come and do a class for us? And it's like, you realize, you realize, and if you didn't know, he went to DuPont Park, you know, I Adventist very well. So you know what I'm all about. And it's like, I do. And it's like, well, the, the, we're, we're going to be able to teach it in a certain way. And, and, and you, know, the, you, know, you know what we're trying to accomplish. And he was like, yeah, I just, I want you guys to come in and do that. And for four weeks, every Sunday, we did something at Everlasting Life. And everybody that we have there was non-Adventist. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I remember one, one MD doctor lady came to me and said, she, I think you know more than me. Now, let me tell you, things that me and you take for granted mm -hmm. that comes from the scriptures, that's right, that's right. it makes, to, to those who don't know, they think you're the most brilliant person in the world because they don't, they don't realize this is God's wisdom, yeah. right? You, you, ever, you ever read what Sister White wrote about ministry of healing? She said, she said of ministry of healing, she says, all the wisdom of the great physician is in ministry of healing. Did you hear what I said? All the wisdom of the great physician. I believe that that quote is in volume six. Mind blowing. And this is the book that that I came into the faith with. So, you know, early on, I knew and, and God placed up on my heart about health. And so, you know, and I didn't have a chance to go to anywhere. Uchi Pines, Meat Ministry, any of that. So I learned at home. Opened up the books, Councils to Diet and Foods, Councils on Health started reading different books, started reading just physiology and anatomy books. And then I was like, well, how can we get it to the people? Okay, we, we can start a medical missionary field school. And then once we did that for the churches, someone non-Adventist would call us. We've gone to companies. Uh, when we were in Grenada, we were invited to the, 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 the telephone company. We heard what you guys are doing. Can you come and do, do that for our staff? You, you get what I'm saying? So it's like we you get invited to places that you wouldn't imagine. I remember one time I got invited to Bowie, some ultra rich neighborhood. This guy was one of the most influential people in the African American community. And you know, he knew politicians, you name it, the whole nine. And when I got there, it's like anywhere you need to go, anything you need, I can do it for you. I know every preacher in town, I know every politician in town, whatever you need. But what I was there for was he had a health challenge. And guess where he heard of, uh, where he heard about us at Everlasting Life from the people that went through our class. So you don't need some ultra, what's the name? Just start where you are. Amen. You know, we started with the churches. Then God said, you know what? You, uh, you know, by God's grace, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. If God sees you being faithful in the little thing, he gives you a promotion. Like he will never send you overseas if you don't have a mission here. He sends you overseas because he's like, now you need a promotion, right? Because you've been faithful here in your own sphere. Now I can trust you to go overseas where there's gonna be a lot more challenge because I know you can handle it. You, you've been faithful, I know you've relied on me. Graduation time, let's go, promotion, right? So think about it that way. Even though it's more challenging to go overseas, it is a promotion and a privilege and an opportunity to get a wider field of influence. So again, start 
where you are in a simple thing. Start handing out books to your neighbors. Plain and simple. Just, just plant a seed in the home, right? Because again, I came through Ministry of Healing. How did I get Ministry of Healing? The church nearby put it on my door. I spoke to no one. No one talked to me. After that seed was planted in my house, it sat there for a year. Then troublous times were in my life. I said I needed God. I thought it was a Jehovah Witness book. I just picked it up, started reading it. My mind was blown. I didn't care about the author. I cared about the content. And the content blew me away. I've never seen God pictured in such a way as a loving God. For the first, I met Jesus through that book, right? So then, seeing that, there was only one person I knew who went to church consistently. And that guy, I called and I said, listen, I need to go to church with you. I don't care where you go. I don't care what denomination. I just need to go to church. I need to, I need to be with God, right? So happened to be, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. So happened to be, that book came from, that, from his church that landed at my door. You get what I'm saying? So God is going to work with us. But those individuals who came and put that book at my door, planted a seed, had no idea where casting their bread up on the waters was going to lead, right? But praise be to God, through faith, they did it. And here I am, you know, 18 years later in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So brothers and sisters, we all have an opportunity to do such type of work amongst our sphere and also in our community next to our home. Brother Raj, you're next, please. Uh, so Brother Bliss, you asked for an example, example. for uh, you know, ministry, virtual ministry, right? Mm -hmm. So four years ago, I, uh, I came across uh, a lady online and uh, I uh, reached out to her via you know, Facebook, actually, I, came, I found her on Facebook, and I reached out to her on through Facebook. And I introduced myself to this lady. And uh, she did not respond to me initially, but I felt very impressed to continue to text her not being pushy. Yeah, not being pushy, uh, but, uh, you know, text her uh, once in a while, uh, and she slowly started responding to me. Now, she was, uh, you know, her her Facebook profile and her pictures were at that time four years ago, um, you know, was very, what is it called? Uh, not even, yeah, scantily dressed, you know. And I think that she thought that I was also one of those guys, you know, just after her for something else. Uh, but I was very impressed with the Holy Spirit to reach her with the gospel. So she, in time, she understood that my intentions were pure. And that's exactly what she told me later on. My intentions were pure. And then she started responding to me. Now, we, we've, we were friends, online friends, for like a year and a half, or a year, or a year and a half or so. After that, uh, I invited her to attend a yoga talk that I was presenting in Jersey. And she tried her best to attend, but she could not attend. And I was very uh, happy that at least she wanted to attend. And Mind you, we've never met in person. I live in Long Island. She lives in, in Brooklyn, New York. And um, pandemic started, lockdowns, right? And uh, she was going to some, some Sunday church at that time in Brooklyn. And then I, I, I found that a lot of our, you know, the people, Adventist friends around me were talking about Daniel, Revelation, end time, and so on and so forth. Then I thought, if I also talk about the same, what's the use of knowing about Daniel Revelation when you don't know Christ? Doesn't make any sense, right? So I thought, okay, let me let me start presenting about Christ's character first. So I started a series of Bible studies, uh, Sabbath uh, afternoon on Zoom, and I invited her, thinking she will not join, but she joined, and I was so happy that she joined. And that was the first time she joined our Bible studies. And she stayed till the end. And then the second week she could not join, but the third week she joined, and the fourth week she joined, and then the fifth week I pitched for Bible studies. She accepted it. And we went through eight months of Bible studies, her and I, on Zoom. Uh, not on Zoom, sorry, or phone. And uh, during that time, she shared about her history, 
uh, her background and the and the abuse that she went through and she also opened up that she was a stripper for almost a decade and how do you react to that when a, when a woman shares that with you you have to be very careful very sensitive about the fact that she's sharing up sharing some of her very private things and also be non-judgmental and be like christ and show compassion right so this is what we have learned we have learned and we're still learning from god's word and from the spirit of prophecy so i continued my bible studies with her long story short she's now a seventh-day adventist Amen. after that um i was impressed to film a documentary about another uh, lady she lives in georgia and uh, she has a very complicated past now i'm not a filmmaker but i was impressed to film her documentary but her documentary is very intense i have no experience filming documentaries so then i prayed about it and I felt impressed to approach my Bible student, who is now an Adventist in Brooklyn, and I asked her, do you mind if I make a documentary of your life? And she said, sure. And I said, uh, how come you said sure so quickly? Like immediately she said, sure. Is it because I'm asking you? She said, yes, because I trust you. I am comfortable with you. I'm willing to be filmed and I'm willing to share everything about my life in the documentary. And the purpose of this documentary is, and by the way, the filming is completed, but we still have a lot more work to do in terms of post-production work for this documentary, for the first documentary. And um, the purpose is to reach women in the adult entertainment industry. So praise the Lord, Josiah Missions is gonna be producing this documentary by God's grace. Um, so we are working to have it completed by God's grace, uh, hopefully uh, this year. Um, we're requesting, if anybody's interested, contact me. Um, and if you are willing to support, it's called um, Darkness to Dawn. Okay, so Sister Dawn is her name. So it's going to be coming out. I'm going to be releasing uh, some, uh, some marketing for that. Uh, we're working on and planning that within the next month. And probably when Dr. Olutunji comes and Dr. Conrad Vine, they'll be here um, in May and June. We're going to be we're going to be um, uh, heavily heavily uh, fundraising for that. So we're looking for about seventeen thousand five hundred uh, to complete this documentary. And this is going to be one of the first documentaries that um, Josiah Missions is going to be producing along with. Um, uh, it's a film by Ivan Raj and by Heidi's Health Kitchen. So we're collaborating on that to produce that. And we're looking forward to what the Lord does. Um, and uh, really to reach out to the unreached, okay? And that's what Jesus Christ himself, who was Mary Magdalene, who was the Samaritan woman, correct? So uh, most of our sisters within the, uh, within the body of Christ, <laughs> if somebody just walks into the church, uh, you know, we're immediately gonna say, do you know about dress reform, right? Or they'll put the sister to the side and say, you know, but you don't know what's going on in her life prior to when she was a child. Number one, you do know that there are sisters in the church that want to test if you're a Christian or not. Right? They want to see, oh, you're a present to church? And yeah, we heard about live births. Let me see if they're really Christian. So they're going to come here to see if you're a real, if you're a real, real Christian or not. All right? So brothers and sisters, this is the purpose of this afternoon and, and uh, as we continue forward. We want to know, are we being real Number one, as Pastor DiCarlo said, okay? Because you know what? The convicts, they know if you're going to be real or not, okay? So if you're being real, because Christ said, you know, have you visited me in the, ch in, in the jails? You know, have you fed me? Have you clothed me? We talk a lot, but we need to, we need to walk that talk now by God's grace. So I'll give you a, a brief testimony, and then we're going to open it up here, and then we're going to close the session out. Now, remember, we're going to be doing this every Every Josiah Missions uh, um, revival weekend moving forward for the rest of the year, okay? So this is not the first and only. We're just setting it up. And I want you all to, next time when we come in, in May and in June, even when Dr. Vine is here, because he's also going to be focusing a lot on mission and evangelism. And also, obviously, Dr. Olutunji, he's doing a lot on social media by God's grace. Uh, you guys have seen a lot of his things. 
Look, we're trying to do it, we're trying to finish the work, okay? It's easy to do social, it's, it's, it's harder to do personal, okay? So with that being said, you know, um, I've been doing some stuff through Josiah Missions as well. And uh, the things that we are doing, and that's why, you know, Brother Ivan Raj, and, uh, you know, when, 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 he, when he proposed this to me, I said yes, <laughs> immediately. <laughs> because, you know, most of our churches and most of our brethren, we are, I think Dwayne Lemon probably brought out um, uh, a sermon, I believe, uh, in regards to um, the trafficking that's going on and a few other things that's going on in, in, in the human trafficking world. Amen. Um, but outside of that, brethren, there's nobody within Adventism that I personally know of that is actually trying to do the work and reach those that are in the world without being judgmental. OK, there are a lot of our people in the community that are uh, dealing with um, um, the LGBTQ community. Um, they're doing uh, they're dealing with a, a lot of different um, lifestyles that are out here in, in 2023. Do we agree that there are a lot of different lifestyles out here in 2023? Yes. OK, it's just it's just not the Adventist lifestyle. OK. It's just not uh, uh, the blue zone lifestyle, correct? Okay, most of the world is not following the blue zone lifestyle. Most of the world, and that's why when Pastor DeCarlo sp uh, spoke early this morning, he was very clear, most of the God's children are where? Outside. Outside. Most of us, bye-bye. Okay, because most of us that like to really focus on the latter part of the three angels message, which is the, health, uh, which is the lake of fire, bye-bye. <laughs> Because that's where most of us are going to be. Because our mentality is that. Our mentality is not Revelation 14, 6, and bringing first the love of Christ to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. Right? Revelation 14, 6 is bring the love of Jesus Christ. And everybody knows if you're being real or if you're being fake. Okay? Because you can come with the Holy Spirit power, okay? But you're trying to convert them. You're not trying to love them. That's it. Some people, they just want to know, are you real? Do you just care about me? Or are you worried about me becoming what you are? So uh, I'll give you one example. There was a brother on, on social media. Now uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff uh, that is um, uh, out of the box. I, I'll, I'll use the word out of the box. So, the, so I got a DM. Now I've been getting DMs uh, from all over the world, OK? So from all over the world, um, so within the past couple of uh, months, uh, I've, I've gained like over, I would say 13, 1100, some, I would even say 20, 20, uh, two, 2300 uh, Facebook friends. And I'm trying to psych out the, uh, the algorithms uh, that are on online. You know, online, uh, the news the feed will only give you what you are consuming uh, in, in, in social media. You, know, you understand that, right? So if you're not consuming, uh, if, and a lot of other people are consuming what? Worldly things, correct? So uh, some of the content that I was putting out there, uh, some, uh, an individual contacted me and uh, they were like, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're a seven day Adventist, you know, this is not, because my content is vulgar. It, it is using um, uh, things of the world. It's out there. I'm using that to, to connect, but I'm putting Bible and spirit of prophecy verses with it. So when they contacted me, I reached out to them. I called them. And they're from the they're from down south, I believe, down south here. So there are other people that I've, I've reached out to in Europe, and there are other people that I've reached out to in the in the um, in the in the Asian Asian countries as well. So, uh, long story short, uh, I reached out to them. I called them three times. Then they finally, um, after a little bit, they called me back, and we connected. Never met this person. Um, you know, they were really basically offended at what I was doing. Then I said, Well, did you see did you see Christ? Did you see Christ's image? Did you see the Bible there? Did you see the spirit of prophecy there? Okay, we as Seventh-day Adventists, if I, if, I, if I put a picture right here, all of us have a vision of a view, okay? We will all interpret based on what is in our mind and in our heart, okay? So like even, even the flyer that I did for this, uh, for this revival, I had what, I, got, I had um, uh, um, yoga and, and uh, Hindu gods and I had Christ there as well. You know, there were some people that just looked at the fact that I was mingling. <laughs> I was mingling truth with error, right? Yeah. So people are coming down to me. How are you going to miss spiritualism with righteousness? How are you going to, you know, uh, I don't serve this. Uh, you know, I'm like, well, then I responded back to them. I said, look, is it okay for me to market and promote and try to reach those that are not of our converted, holy, Seventh-day Adventist faith? Okay. I'm, I asked the question. I asked a simple question. Can I create marketing or can I create things 
to attract those. You know, the world is doing it. You know that, right? Okay. All the Fortune 500 companies, uh, they're, they're spending millions and millions of dollars to create ads that are what? 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, right? So they can sell their products and reach, uh, reach uh, uh, the world, right? Do you know right now the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and our, our beloved Catholic Church, they have ads out there on, uh, on uh, YouTube, on television, and on radio. You know that? That's true. Okay? I don't know. Look, brethren, a lot of us are so, we're, we're hermits, okay? A lot of us have no idea what the world is doing, and we have no idea what everybody's doing out there. We have to be able to be uh, relevant in these last days. So long story short, now that individual that was condemning me uh, is now become a friend. Not only that, they see my feeds because what I do on one end, on the other end, I'm doing totally spiritual and I'm, I'm bringing in. Now, every time on the Sabbath, now they're putting, posting things and saying happy Sabbath on their own feed. And they're not even, and, and they're not even Adventists, they're non-denominational, okay? So now every Sabbath I'm looking, okay? And uh, they're interracial um, individuals. So every Sabbath I'm looking, and now they're putting Happy Sabbath, okay? Now they're putting things out. Now we talked about race as well. You see what I'm saying? Because they're from the South. So I said, you know, I'm trying to do the Southern work, okay? I'm not African-American, but I don't see nobody doing the Southern work within the African-American community. And I've been here at LBM for seven years. So we're coming out with media right now. That, so we've created, um, we've created uh, Booker T. Washington. Uh, we have created um, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, and we're doing a lot of other things, okay, to really reach those within our people groups and also reach those within our actual sphere of influence. So with that being said, I'm opening it up now to the audience. Uh, if anybody has a question for our panel, Brother Dre. Um, it's not more so. Well, I actually do have a question, but I wanted to make a statement to all that you guys said. And, um, See, as I just became a seven day Adventist. So, you know, when I see the three angels message, that message is not just for the church, but it's supposed to go to the whole entire world. And not only just the first, the first angel says, and I saw another angel flying in the midst, having an everlasting gospel to preach unto the whole world, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But then Revelation 18:4 is very clear on God's pe on who God's people are. And they're not just part of this church. They're in other folds. So just like how the Jews had the responsibility of having that everlasting gospel to preach unto the world, which they totally blew it, it's now our job to go to these other people with love, preaching the everlasting gospel so that they have a chance to see eternal life. And I, and I think um, the things that I see in the church, in the Seven Day Adventist Church, I'm, I'm really starting to see a lot of things that you guys are talking about that you know, as a church, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And we're not being real with ourselves. And that was actually, that's actually going into my next questions because Pastor Ray Carlo brought up James 5. Um, I believe it's verse, correct me if I'm wrong, 18 or 19? 16. 16. 16. And my question is, because um, I, I agree with everything that you said, Pastor Ray Carlo. So would you say it's more so not that we're confessing our sins, but it's about being real with one with that other individual that's trying to seek Christ. Because I've been in many situations where people will ask me, for example, they'll say, "Oh, you think you become you could become perfect?" This and that. I'm like, "Hold on now, it's not that I can become perfect because I'm wretched, I'm filthy, just like how you feel filthy. I'm very filthy, but I know I can become perfect." through the faith in the works that I have through Jesus Christ who can make me perfect. So when you said that, I didn't, I didn't, cause most people would hear that and say, oh, is he saying that the King James Bible is not real? Because no, all he's saying based on that context of that verse is we have to be real with ourselves. The only way that we're gonna be able to evangelize the people and people and be able to win souls for Christ if we're actually being real with ourselves and being real with the type of things that we deal with in this world and not moving as if our own stuff doesn't stink. The thing, is, the thing about the, uh, the, thing about the uh, James uh, 516, confess your faults one to another. Uh, the argument that you find, historically speaking, reference to that text when it was translated, um, obviously came from the Bishop's Bible, but it, it did not come from previous translations of the Bible because they were mainly from John Rogers and William Tyndale. 
And, um, and the thing is, the reason it was changed from the word confess, it actually, uh, the, um, and by the way, uh, John Wesley in 1755, when he wrote his New Testament, used the word acknowledge. He never used the word confess. The Protestants, and I'm talking true Protestants, because the Anglican Church is a Protestant church. The problem is this, the Anglican Church is divided into two groups. You have the high church and the low church. The high church is Catholic. They're the bishops who run the church. The low church is Protestant. The Puritans were Anglicans who dissented against the corruption of the Anglican church by the Roman Catholic theology. So they, along with others, said, wait a minute, we don't agree with this. That text should be translated, acknowledge your faults one to another. You see, because the reason being is you have to understand the difference between the doctrine of, of, of look, there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, either you believe that or you don't. Now, Mix, I know you do. I'm not saying that. But the Protestants said, if that's the case, then that word confess cannot be used because that implies, that implies the doctrine of the confessional, which then carries with it the implications of the priesthood being the essential means by which you find mediation to have your sins forgiven. Because you have to understand Catholic theology. The Anglican Church, High Church, is in full agreement with that doctrine. That's why the Bishop's Bible is called the Bishop's Bible. It in, reinforces the doctrine of the High Church. See, the King of England under Henry VIII, he, when he threw off the yoke of Rome, now, he wasn't doing it because he was a reformer or he was a good guy. He was an immoral pervert who lusted for power. And the only reason he threw off the Rome, the yoke of Rome was because he couldn't get a divorce that they the, from from uh, I forgot her name. Now you have to forgive me, but he couldn't get a divorce. And uh, and the Pope said, we're not going to grant you the, 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 the permission. And he said, well, I don't need you. <laughs> who are you? I'm the king of England, so off with you. I'm now the head of the church as well. And thus began the birth of the Anglican church. Well, once you do that, you now have to, you have to now define certain particular doctrines relative not just to, to, to the theology of the bishops, but to the king himself. So the king is the head of the church and the state. So that doctrine, the confession, when, when King James issued a, that a translation be written. Now remember, if you read the rules he laid out and gave to the bishops, he did not want a new translation. You find nowhere, nowhere he says, I want a complete new translation. He doesn't say that because he knows and understands the implications of what that means. He says, all I want you to do is take the bishop's Bible from, 16, from 1568, Queen Elizabeth. He says, I, want, I just want you to clean it up. Now, the reason he invited the Puritans onto the committee was to appease them. Because he wanted political unity as well as religious unity. And so he invited the Puritans on. And by the way, of the 55, 57 uh, scholars that were on the committee to go through the King James or the Bishop's Bible and then produce the King James, they weren't among the finest scholars in Europe. Uh, or excuse me, they weren't the best. I should, they were among them, but they weren't the best. Some of them were, but some of them were. Matter of fact, there was a scholar in Scotland, I forgot his name, but he was, he was the most proficient scholar, I forgot of, um, I think it might have been Old Testament, but nonetheless, but he was an enemy, political enemy of King James. So the only reason they did not use him on the committee was because he and King James were, were vehemently opposed. And he was a staunch Puritan, a staunch Protestant. So they said, no, now he's the greatest scholar that you could possibly have, and you're not going to put him on your committee to translate the Bible? Why wouldn't you do that? And he's not the only one. Why didn't they invite the, 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 the uh, scholars from Geneva? Say, so you come on over. They were among the finest in the world. Why didn't they come on over? Many of them were Englishmen. So look, you've got to understand something. It may be insignificant, or at least appear to be insignificant regarding a particular word there, but that word means everything. Because if it's confess, then that's Roman Catholic theology. If it's acknowledged, that's Protestant. 
We do not confess our, our, our sins to one another, but we do acknowledge our sins to one another. I acknowledge I sinned against you. Please forgive me. Now, that is pure Protestant theology. I don't need a priest. I don't need the Church of Rome. I need no denomination for that, for that matter. I just need Jesus Christ. I need to make humble myself before you, acknowledge I'm sorry. Please forgive me and reconcile from that level. So you see, there was, as I said, there was a debate. William Tyndale and Sir Thomas More fought over this. Literally, this was a debate. They wrote articles back and forth on this. And he didn't win the argument, William Tyndale, um, sadly to say. Um, but uh, if you go and you can do this, you can go online. I think you could, um, if you look at um, William Tyndale's translation, 1535 or 1534, whichever, because uh, both of them are the same fundamentally. And you can go, you do a Google search, I think, or internetarchives.org, and you can download it for free. You can look at the, you can, you can see the difference. Um, and uh, look, I don't have a problem per se with the King James. I preach from it. What I do have a problem with, with certain things. When you understand the history and you understand certain verses, for example, we, we, none of us here, knowing what we know regarding the state of the dead, acknowledge the verse in Luke where it says, today you will, you know, what Jesus says to the thief on the cross, you know, today you will be with me in paradise. He doesn't say, he says, today, comma, today you will be, today I promise you, this day I promise you, comma, you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't say today you will be with me in paradise. Now that comma was put in there by man. That's not a Greek translation. The Greek, if you go to the Eastern text, original language, Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, they don't have punctuation. There's no such thing. So that was put in there by man. Who's going to acknowledge that that is actual biblical? I'm not. Listen, when I do evangelism, I have to address that and prove to the people that doesn't belong there. And uh, so there are certain issues whether it's grammatical whether it's it's certain translations words particular words um that are and it's mainly mainly has to do with king james wanting to defend his political position and he did so by defending the bishops of rome because there was a saying where there, if there's no bishop there's no king in other words if the bishops fell there goes the there goes king james He's got nobody to support him. See, the only, re listen, everybody, if you read books about the translation of the King James, they make King James out like he's a saint. Now, I'm not saying he was, a, he was a corrupt, demented, deranged person. However, though, look, he was a political animal and he understood politics. He wasn't stupid. And it was to his advantage, politically speaking, because let me tell you, people will kill you for kingship. And many kings of the past were killed, murdered, just because they occupied the throne. Their brother wanted it, or their cousin, or somebody else from Europe. They wanted that throne. So what do they care if they lop your head off? So you have to understand from his perspective, he's looking at it from multiple areas. Um, but it, it, to him, confess, defended the position of the bishops, which defended the Church of England, which defended him. That's the only reason. Oh, oh, no, thank you, panelists, for um, your comments. I just wanted to add something positive to share with you. I am I come here to Light Bearers. I belong to Dupont Park Seven Adventist Church, and I run over here with my mother with the prison ministry team. So when I'm able to, I come here because Brother Bliss invites us. But just to share something positive at Dupont, we have what we call a diaper hub. Right before the pandemic, we realized that there are families in the community. My church is in Southeast DC, and they they may have food stamps or WIC, but doesn't pay for diapers who are very expensive. So we started at the right before the pandemic at the very beginning to have a drive-by diaper giveaway. And that has blossomed over the pandemic. So now every Tuesday, we give away diapers. Anyone anywhere in the community who can drive by and pick up diapers for free for their for their um, infants and toddlers. And on February the seventh, um, the Holy Spirit had just impressed me to set up another table on the parking lot where we do that. And I have steps to steps to Christ. Amazing in fact, any Christian literature, it's just free as they drive by. There's a food bank, diaper hub, 
and then there's literature. So I just praise God that we are opening up to the community in um, Southeast DC. Just wanted to share that. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Brethren, so, praise the Lord. So that's, brethren, that's practical evangelism. Amen. And we as a church need to be uh, more on fire to really serve our community. Because if we are not here, then will the, will, will the community miss us? That's the question. Okay. So I do have a question. And um, it's based on outreach. So I have been running into a lot of people who are Baptists. And everybody seems to have the same argument. And the argument is, you don't know which day is the seventh day. I mean, I understand what the Bible says. I know what the Bible says. But how would you um, address these Baptist people? How would you get into, um, you know, it says mingle with them to get the truth across these people? Well, praise the Lord. Speaking of our, our Baptist brethren, uh, uh, can I can I give our Baptist brethren the, uh, the 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 mic so you can tell us exactly how we can come and minister you to you all? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, I, a couple of points I, I wrote down, and one thing that came out to mind was my wife is always is asking the pastor is how to get young people involved, and one of the things you have to do you have to gain their trust. And you can't be judgmental. I think that's one of the reasons why it's hard to get the young people involved. So that's one of the things we're doing. Oh, oh. oh the Sabbath. Oh, well. Oh, goodness. God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, as I kept continuing to read and study the Word of God, the Holy Spirit kept coming to me. The Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. And it, it, it was going on for like maybe about three years. Till finally, I said, "This I can't take no more." And so, this is real. This is a true story. And um, every time I turn around, something saying about the Sabbath day. So I start turning my TV on to 3 a.m. And I got really, I got so hooked on them. They really explained to me about the Sabbath day. And I said, oh my goodness, all these years, and I've been in my church for 30 years. And I said, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And I continued to pray, allow the Holy Spirit to use me. And um, I went, to make a long story short, I went to my uh, pastor. I told him that I need to talk to him. And so we had a Zoom call. So I had my husband with me to talk to him. And I want to talk to him about the Sabbath day. Well, he didn't want to hear about it. He said he knows all about this. I said, but wait a minute. Now, this, now if you know all about it, why, why don't we celebrate the Sabbath day? Because out of all the commandments, it always says, remember. And that kept getting in my head, remember, remember. He said, well, we can talk about this later. I said, no, we're not, because I'm going to do what God called me to do. So I kept praying and praying till finally we had another, man, make a long story short, uh, we had another meeting on Zoom. I had my husband with me again, and I told him that um, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to leave it. I can't, I can't. I have to uh, honor God, not man. Amen. And um, he said, "Well, we need you here." I said, "Well, they need me there," <laughs> and God calling me to do that. And I said, "I don't know the purpose, reason why I'm here." I know about the Sabbath day, but I know God is going to use me. Yeah. And um, we had, uh, again, we talked again, and he said that he need to talk to me again. Well, there's no need to talk, but the only thing I could do now is pray for my pastor yeah. and, uh, and lift him up in prayer. Now, now, praise the Lord to answer your question, sis. So, so this is a practical example. Uh, so uh, brother and sister Sutton came to, to Light Bear's mission on a Josiah ministry weekend, amen? Yeah. So by God's grace, we fell in love with you all. So by God's grace, so you all are family by God's grace. But this is what I'm talking about, practical evangelism. And, and, uh, and we need to understand, brethren, we, don't, we might be talking amongst ourselves here, correct? But you know, there, there could be a million people watching us right now. 
and the way we talk, or we, we can make it feel like we are uh, ignorant because we come off too self-righteous, okay? So we have to understand, uh, we have to understand uh, definitely that uh, we need to change our mindset specifically here at Light Bears Mission Seventh Day Adventist Church. Because I've been here seven years, okay? I've stayed silent for seven years. But now because I'm also a leader of the deacons department, uh, that has opened up a, a that has opened up a doorway for me. Even though I was Josiah Missions, I was very careful in what I did. And, and Elder, Elder Mungin knows, I told him specifically that I'm going to be behind the scenes most of the time here at Light Bears because I'm not African-American. Okay, so within our African-American communities, we want to see African-American brothers rise up. So I have specifically been behind the scenes for that reason. However, now because I am serving as the, as the leader of the deacons, it is my moral responsibility to bring out some of the things that we have not been doing that we should have been doing seven years ago. Okay, so the Lord and I didn't want that role. So the, the board knows that everybody knows I didn't want that role because of my current situation. But now I'm in that position. So I am going to be for the rest of the year, as long as I'm in that position as well, um, to bring out these things, because I think that we have a moral responsibility to our community. Um, and if you have not seen God himself working, um, obviously we are supposed to be going out. We are not supposed to be expecting the community just to walk in. Praise the Lord, Sister Sutton and Brother Sutton came and walked in. Amen? Amen. Now she walked in and I called Brother James and I called Brother Sutton and I said, you know, I told him straight up. I never met him, but I told him I love you. Amen? All right. All right. So then he, so then he, he was reluctant to talk to me, but then Sister Sutton said, you know, I know him. You call him. So by God's grace, and you know, obviously, you know, we love your pastor as well. You see what I'm saying? But Brother Sutton, you know, we know what the pastor is doing too. But you know, we got to stand up. And, and you're a man, I'm a man, we got to stand up. And obviously, they don't want to lose you. You see what I'm saying? So your pastor is going to say what he said. So we missed you for those couple of weeks, but I'm glad you're here this afternoon. Amen. Amen. So you follow the Holy Spirit. Amen. You don't follow no man. At Light Bearers Mission, we're just a building. But we want to show you the love of Christ because we love you. And to your answer, that's how you're going to get your, your Baptist friends. When you show them the love of Christ and you mingle with them practically, not to convert them, but just be friends. Okay, that's all you got to do is be friends. Uh, brother, brother Green, and then we're going to end. Because look, we're going to come back because Brother, uh, brother um, uh, Benjamin is going to go. And then we're going to close early today because our 5 o'clock o'clock speaker got sick. So we, we're not going to do the 5 o'clock. So we're just going to go directly into um, yoga unboxed, okay? And we're going to end early today. Liz, can I just make a so. quick answer to her question? I'm sorry. Oh, I just I wanted to get. say that um, you know you we have to we have to agree with people on what we can so that we develop the friendship and the love and and win their trust and those types of things. Um, but you know, of course, you could do research on the calendar. God's seven-day calendar has never changed, although other minor changes have been attempted to be made throughout history. God's seven-day cycle has never changed. But I would encourage you to be praying for this friend or coworker or whoever it might be, and challenge them to ask God about the seventh day. Because did you know that there are Seventh-day Baptists? They're very prominent in New York. I don't know about here, but there are Seventh-day Baptists. They're, they're going to church on the Sabbath. They have almost the exact same beliefs that we do, except for they don't properly understand the state of the dead. So, you know, God takes us step by step. He meets us where we are, and he takes us step by step. And maybe if, if this person, uh, you know, asks God and prays about it, maybe she will transition from a Sunday Baptist to a Seventh-day Baptist, and maybe that's the step that God wants her to take. But I would encourage you to lovingly have this conversation where you ask her, you know, I'm curious about your own denomination. There, there are Seventh-day Baptists. What do they think about the seventh day? So Brother Bliss, and um, I'm right there with you, my sister, because that's where I was going to go. Um, the way you get folks to hear you is to ask more questions. Yeah. And once you begin to understand why they believe what they believe, it's not that you go tit for tat. It's just that you continue to educate yourself and them. So, Brother Ben, 
in my family, I am the only Seventh-day Adventist. And when I say in my family, the only Seventh-day Adventist, my grandmother had 12 kids. I'm the only grandchild that's a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, imagine going to a family reunion or going to a wedding and you're the only Seventh-day Adventist in the room. Now, the point is, to answer your question, my sister, is you got to be curious. You got to continue to ask them and say to them is, so why do you believe that way? And they would say, well, that's the way I grew up. That's all that I know. Well, maybe they didn't want to tell you everything. Maybe it's tradition. Maybe it was out of respect for your grandmother because most of my family, out of respect for my grandmother, go to church on Sunday. Now imagine going against everyone who goes to church on Sunday and you're telling that your grandmother is wrong. But she's not wrong. That's the only light that she had. Now I'm dealing with my brother who knows the Sabbath day is Saturday. Still goes on Sunday. And guess what he asked me for recently? What book can you give me to read about seven day events? And that's been going on what, at least what, 10 years? With my brother who's trying to find something he is. The point is be patient and the sister's right. When you pray to God to help plant the seed, pray to God to help water the seed. The point is, when he's watering, you just have to be there to do what? Tend to it. That's all I'm saying. Amen. With that being said, I just want to thank everybody uh, as we're going to transition um, into uh, Brother Ben. And Brother, is it Ifrim, right? Uh, the other brother that's going to be presenting with you? Yeah. Ifrim? Yeah. Okay. Praise the Lord. So, my brother, how you doing? You remember me? I remember you. I still got your number, bro. So, so praise the Lord. So look, brothers and sisters, I just want to say, you know, we love everybody by God's grace. Um, one thing that I will go encourage, uh, you see the variety here, amen? amen? Okay, but look at us as being one. Amen. Okay, we're one brothers and sisters in Christ, amen? And that's what I'm going to encourage everybody to do moving forward. If we, if we can do that, if we can stop, if we can look beyond that, you know, we have a lot of people that come to LBM that, are, that don't look like us but they look some, some, uh, of a different uh, hue, shade, color, shape, and form, amen? If we look at them as if we look at us, we would need by probably like six LBMs by now, okay? Unity is what we need, okay? And love in the truth, okay? And that's across all boards, brethren, because I've been at completely, totally Indian uh, congregations, I've been in mixed congregations, there are Asian congregations, and there are African-American congregations, and all of that is going on within the Adventist church. That's why the North American division, in my opinion, is totally dead and flat because we're segregated. Okay, so we're going to be talking about these things when Dr. Olutunji comes and when Dr. Conrad Vine comes, um, specifically um, in regards to how can we um, reach practically and not be judgmental, but uh, really apply Christ's method in, in all spheres of our life, whether the marketplace, whether at work, uh, whether at home, whether on social media, whether on the bus, whether on the train, wherever we are, okay? It, are people seeing Christ in you? Are you loving? Are you kind? Are you non-judgmental non and condemnatory? And the other extreme, if you're like so gung-ho about the present truth and the three angels message, okay, uh, are you a loving and lovable Christian, okay? My question is, we are so gung-ho, where are all our friends all the time when we're doing stuff? I heard something. Somebody said, okay, let's move on. Was that correct? Yes, I had a question. Good morning, man. So, brothers and sisters, we need the love of Christ. I have a we statement. will move on, but in the love of Christ. Let's, let's kneel with a with prayer. Father God, we, we want to thank you once again for all your blessings this Sabbath, Lord. Help us, I pray, Father, to reflect the love of Christ to everyone we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we'll take a five minute break while Brother Ben and Brother Ephraim set up, and then we're going to finish up with the yoga unbox. 
and we're going to end early, okay? And we have food as well. So we have supper, okay? We have a lot of yummy stuff uh, right after this, okay? So, so stick around. God bless you. Am I, am I audible? Well, oh. this is Jeff. Can you hear me? Hey, Jeff, I'm here too. How are you? Hi, doing? Sister Paris. I'm well, thank you. Um, did you see my comment earlier? <laughs> it, yeah, I did. I but I couldn't read it. Well, I don't read English too well. Uh, can you do me a favor later? Give me a call, please. Sure, I can do that. I can do that. Um, just want to say.